Our meditation hymn this morning is hymn number 82. Good morning, brethren and sisters, and welcome here this morning. We have received loving fraternal greetings from the Blackburn Ecclesia through Brother Fred Derricky. Uh, also, brethren and sisters Phil and Deb Nolan, Paul and Belinda Dyer, and Matt and Lynn Jeffress returning from Fiji bring with them greetings from the Nandi and Suva Ecclesias. Uh, we also heard about the accident involving the Nolans earlier on this week, and we pray that our loving Heavenly Father may continue to be with them and bring them back to full health and strength again. We also heard this morning that the mother of our brother Rodney Newman passed away uh, and our thoughts and prayers are with the Newman family at this time. It's good that we can gather together again this morning as a, a family on a, a brisk winter's morning as we come before our Lord, the table of our, our Saviour, and we can drink deeply of the word to be refreshed and ready and waiting for our Lord's return. 
This morning, let us begin our meeting of remembrance with hymn 361 to be followed by prayer. Almighty Father, our God, our rock and our shield, we come before you now in prayer, asking for your guidance and your care as we meet together here this morning to remember your Son, the sacrifice that you and he both gave for our freedom from death. And Father, this morning as we meet together, our longing in our heart is that we are interrupted by your Son's return. By your kingdom, when the earth will show your glory as you created it. And Father, as we wait for that day, we ask that you be with all of those who hold your name dear, who follow in your statutes. Father, we pray for those who are going through trials at the moment. And we thank you for being with those who have recovered, Phil and Levi, and we pray that you be with the Newman family as they deal with their their trials too. All those who are not here for whatever reason, be with them, strengthen them so that we may meet together again and be with us as we we sit and we contemplate your word. May it be as a two-edged sword that cuts through our intents and our thoughts that can get to our hearts. Help us to use the sacrifice that we remember this morning to motivate our lives to grab hold of it with two hands so that we can live our lives according to your awesome love. So, Father, we leave leave this morning in your care and we ask this prayer through our Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
This morning our brother Lionel is to exhort us and encourage us and he's asked that we read 2 Timothy chapter 2 as a basis for this exhortation. I'll now call forward brother Brian Bennett to read that for us. Reading with you, brethren and sisters, from the second of Timothy, chapter 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except the strive that he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he also will deny us. And if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to, to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. <coughs> Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart, that foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will.
Thank you for that reading, Brother Brian. I'll now hand over to Brother Lionel to deliver his word of exhortation. Brother Tim, my dear brethren and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are, I believe, living in the very, very last days before our Lord's return. Constantly we read of earthquakes, floods, fires, that not only happening in this country but throughout the whole world in diverse places the Lord Jesus Christ told us would happen. We see violence. Violence increasing on an unprecedented scale. Across the globe, mankind's hearts are fearing for the evil that is overtaking this world. And we realise this is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ said would be signs to us, the believers, that he is about to return. And when we hear these things, when we see these things, how does it really affect us personally? Because you see, the sons and daughters of the living God have to hear what our Master tells us. And hearing those things and seeing them physically happening before our very eyes should affect in the way we live. So how's the last few weeks been in our own personal lives? The greatest curse that we all face is the world about us, the pressure that it puts on us, how it wants us to think in a certain way, how it leads us not into the ways of godliness but the ways of corruption. Brethren, even this morning I spoke to two brethren and the same thing came out. We are crushed by the workplace. The world demands more and more of our time. Because that is where we get our money. This is where we make our living. And we have to keep us and our family to a situation that we've grown so used to. Doesn't it crush us, my dear brethren? And sisters, wives, who are trying to attend the ecclesia and attend to their own babies and their own children, trying to bring them up in a godly way, are constantly being pressured by the things that kids see and hear and want in their own daily lives. So how has the last couple of weeks affected the ecclesia? We see the brotherhood. We try to counteract these things. We put things on. You take in the city alone the last two, three weeks. We had a youth early evening. Where many brethren and sisters of the city gathered together to hear an ambassador of Israel come and speak about how the last 70 years has gone in the restoration of Israel. And we sat and we listened and we realised that they are there in unbelief exactly as the Bible has told us they will be. And we understand that as they are witnesses to the believers that God is real and that the faith we hold is right and it is the one and true plan and purpose that our God is proving to the whole world that this earth will soon be filled with his glory. We had a prophecy day the other Saturday. Three brethren got up and they spoke about the things that are affecting this world, exactly what we just talked about. They showed us by slides and signs and took us to many scripture to show that we are right on the cusp of the Lord's return. And last Sunday evening here, in our own meeting, we had our brother Mike Hyman give a great presentation on all the things that we have just spoke about. And what are these things for? To encourage us personally to hold on to the faith that has been delivered to us. And yet how many of those three things did we personally attend? How many of them did we go to that we might fight for our own salvation and listen to those things which are prepared by the brotherhood? You see, these things are real. They're put on, not for the sake of very few, but for all of us to realise 
that the only way we will find salvation is in the ecclesia and to hold fast to the hope that's been delivered to us. And how precious is that hope to us, my dear brothers and sisters? You know, if I stood here today and said to you, in exactly three weeks' time, we all will be standing before the judge of the whole earth, how would that affect us? You think about that, my dear brothers and sisters. It could well be in three weeks we could be standing before the judge of the whole earth, our Lord Jesus Christ. What will all the things of this world matter? Next month, we know as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the commencement straight after that of the Feast of the Tabernacles. We see all these things happening. We know for sure that our Master is about to return. And yet what stresses us in our daily life? What really pushes us to hold fast to the hope given to us? We come to Timothy, and this is Paul's last letter before he was executed. And he desperately wanted Timothy to know the very things that were dear to his heart. It was his last book, and therefore it's his last book to you and I. And so what he puts in writing here should be of the utmost importance to us personally. Because this is the great Apostle Paul to the Gentiles penning these last words to say to the Ecclesia, I want you to understand these things. And you know what? It always boils, boils straight back to you personally. You can't blame me if you're not in the truth. I can't blame you for discouraging me in the truth. We can't blame each other. We will never get to before the Lord Jesus Christ and say to him, well, it was because of him or her or them or thus that I didn't try. Paul goes to the very essence of what our problems are in daily life. He has written to us. He wants us to learn that it's all to do with faith. And so what does he say? He tells us is how we conduct our own personal lives. And if you consider, my dear brethren and sisters, how much time we waste talking about others and how little time we talk about ourselves and our own faith, you take note, and I'm sure you'll be staggered of how many hours we waste. What does Paul say to Timothy? Well, in chapter 1, he says to him in verse 5 of Timothy, 2 Timothy, I call thee to remembrance and to remembrance of the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which was dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. So he says to Timothy, the faith that you have got, I want you to remember this, is passed on by the grandparents, by the mother. And how many of us are sitting here that have been fortunate to have people uh, uh, in the truth before us? Parents who have guided us and brought us to the truth. And yet there's so many also sitting here who have found the truth and are the only ones in it. And yet how much support do we give to them? And this is the only thing that we all have in common. A personal faith. Another quote for these words of these unfeigned faith is sincere trust. Do we sincerely trust our Lord Jesus Christ that he's going to lead us not into temptation, that he's, not going, to, he's going to deliver us from evil and he wants us to be part of his bride of Christ? Do we have that sort of sincere trust? It's really all about our Heavenly Father. That he's looking to each one of us, and still today, to see if we have and manifest that personal faith. And this sincere faith can only, only be de developed in our lives by the word of God. We have to want to know what our God wants of us. 
We have to know what the great and precious promises in the Bible that the words that are written will come to pass and it's for our own good that we read. Do we believe 1 Timothy 1 verse 9 when it says who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world came. Do we believe that my dear brothers and sisters? Because every single one of us here this morning that, that's us that he's speaking about. Our God has a plan and purpose with this earth. It has been mapped out well before the creation started. And we, yes, each one of us, were called to be part of this wonderful plan and purpose way before we were even born. Is this something to be proud of? Oh, we're very special. Well, in essence, we are special, my dear brothers and sisters, but it's not because of ourselves. It is the purpose and grace of God that he is going to fill this earth with his glory and he's doing it through unperfect people like us. What does verse 10 say? But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And so it is through the preaching of the gospel that Paul himself was saved. And yet it was through the preaching of the gospel that he found himself in bonds and was about to suffer death because of that gospel. Is that how we look at our gospel that we have been given? How much do we really place the gospel above our own personal daily needs? Paul was about to face death. And yet he could say in verse 12, of chapter 1 for this which cause I suffer these things nevertheless I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day therefore hold fast the former sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus are we holding those same things precious to ourselves? It is and will be by God's good grace that these things and these words were written down for us some and kept for some 2,000 years that you and I sitting here today can look at them. They are recorded in what's sitting in the book on our lap at the moment, the Bible. And so here we are 2,000 years after they were written. Are we? Or do we really hold fast to the gospel message, to the hope that Paul wrote about? Do we love our Bible? In other words, do we love the gospel message? Well, well how are we going to answer that question? I can't answer for you and you have no clue at all about me. There's one way we can answer this question, my dear brethren and sisters, and it's very, very simple. And I want you to be perfectly honest with yourself. Nobody else, think of yourself and ask this question, do I love my Bible? Do I love the gospel message? Do I love the things of God? Well, yes, if I do, how easy it is to understand that I do because I want to read the Bible. How many times in a day do I think about the gospel message? How many times in the day do I open my Bible to check what I'm thinking about? Or perhaps, how many times have we spoke about it and opened the Bible in the last week? Did we discuss much about the last extra? The last Bible class? You see, I can't answer those questions for you. No, nobody can, except for ourselves. And how honest are we? Paul said to hold fast. What in? In verse 13, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 
Aren't we all called to be in Christ Jesus? Aren't we all part of the bride, the future bride of Christ? Do we love our Lord? Are we really studying the Bible in these last days, particularly with all the pressures that are upon us? These are very real, po very real points that every one of us has to ponder this morning before partaking of these emblems, which is representation of our Lord's life and death. And Paul continues to encourage Timothy in these facts. You see, if he didn't think we were going to fail, he wouldn't have bothered to write these words. He wouldn't have written them just for the sake of it. He was at his death nail and he penned these things for all of us to recall. If you had an important message to pass on, if you knew you were going to die, what would you say to your own family? Oh, I've left you lots of money. It's all behind. You can spend it and enjoy yourself. Is that what we would write? Is that what would be in our mind? You would want your children to be in the kingdom age. You would hope by the grace of God that you're going to be in the kingdom age. Else why would we bother to be here? And so the Apostle Paul continues in 2 Timothy. He says, Thou therefore, chapter 2, verse 1, My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Are we strong in the grace? Or are we trying to walk in our own strength? We know that if it wasn't for the grace of God given to each one of us, we would all walk away from the truth. We wouldn't bother opening our Bibles because we really think it's too hard anyway, and why bother? There's not one of us sitting here this morning that will be in the kingdom age because of their own personal strength. We need to and we have to want and love the gospel message. And at the end of the day, it still will only be by the grace of God. And there are responsibility for us to hold on to. We have responsibilities as sons and daughters of the living God. Well, verse 2 says, And these things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Now, that's a responsibility. Every single one of us sitting here this morning has this responsibility given to us. The things Timothy heard is exactly what we hear ourselves from the Bible, the gospel message. It was the gospel, the same gospel that we hold today, that was committed to faithful men. What purpose was it committed to them for? To teach others also of the wonders of the power of salvation that's found in the gospel. Well, we have to ask the question, are we faithful servants? Is pleasing our Lord exactly what we want to do? Is the Bible something that we can have options of reading if we feel like it, if we've got time, we're so busy with everything else? We, we, you know, these are the questions that we shouldn't even be asking, my dear brothers and sisters. If we love something, we want to know about it. Our commission is to preach the word. If we don't know what the gospel message is, how can we teach it to others? It was the last time that Paul was to speak to Timothy. It could well be our last times as well before we meet our own death or meet our Lord in the day of his return. How much do we really preach and speak to each other, let alone to others? I would be the biggest hypocrite if I stood up here this morning and said, well, I do. You know, that's such hypocritical. I would probably be exactly the same as you. When an opportunity arises, I think, firstly, oh, should I say something? Um, am I cast my pearls before swine? You see, because this is the flesh thinking, that's exactly what we all do. 
Is it appropriate at the moment? Or perhaps it's, it's not really a good time to say anything because all these people are standing around. I then have to ask myself, well, what is a good time? Whenever is a good time to preach the truth? The truth is that if the gospel of salvation was the uppermost important thing that was running through my mind, I would speak it to anyone at any time and it wouldn't make a scrap of difference to me. Whether they heard it or shunned it, it should not make a scrap of difference because the word of God is the only thing, the only thing that will bring us to salvation and give us eternal life. It is God that calls my dear brothers and sisters, not us. We, we can preach, we can have to get up and it's good for us. Noah preached for 120 years and he worked every day at saving himself. But he was still saved by grace. If we're not working and preaching, what are we working for? This privilege of spreading the gospel message has and is passed on to us. We have to work on it and use it. How often do we really speak about it to the people we meet? You know how many times I have driven away or walked away from a person and said, I should have said something back there. There was a little opening there. I could have said something. Yes, the world is bad, but it will going to be changed soon. The Lord Jesus Christ is about to return to set a righteous kingdom up on this earth. You know, these things go through your head, but do you say anything? It was only very recently that I delivered, as you know, to so many people's houses, and I was in the house and the lady was pouring out her heart to me that she was, had lung cancer and she was about to die and she was buying this thing as a little gift for herself. And I looked at her and I felt so sorry. She wasn't expected to live much longer. And what was I going to say to her? Oh, big womb, enjoy your tally and have a great time. Because that's what I felt like saying. And as I drove away from that place, I felt so guilty that I hadn't opened my mouth and even said one thing about the only thing that could save her from her death. Knowing the gospel message. And how often do we do that in our own life? We hold a key to life. No, more than a key to life, we have a key to eternal life. And how often do we speak to others about that wonderful thing? Sobering, isn't it? I feel so slack so many times. It was our Lord in John 17 that said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And the truth of the matter is that all mankind about it are dying. If they don't understand the gospel message, if they don't be baptised into the covenant name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are as good as dead men walking. And how often do we think of that? We, my dear brethren and sisters, have been given the key to salvation. And Paul continues in 2 Timothy at verse 3 where he says, You have to teach others. Therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruits. And how often and many times have we been exhorted about these three things that Paul chose us. We'll briefly look at them. The soldier. If he doesn't train and prepare his himself for a battle, he won't last long as a soldier, will he? He will do everything, though, in his power to save himself, to please his commanding officer. He will not let the affairs of daily life stand in the way of doing his duty. And not only will his life depend on his readiness to battle, but the lives of his fellow soldiers are at risk if he fails. And putting that into ecclesial terms, my dear brethren and sisters, 
and we think about this aspect of Christ, do we fail others? Do we let our brethren and sisters down? You see, when we fall short, do we consider the effects of our sins that's going to be on our brethren and sisters in our own ecclesia and then on to the brotherhood? And the effects that we have when we're fighting to appease those sins, to justify ourselves, do we really think about the effect on the brotherhood? It is God, our fathers, we have already said, that calls us to be part of the brotherhood. And in this verse, he becomes then the commanding officer that's called us. And the Lord Jesus Christ is at our head. So how do we affect our God and our master when we fail him so badly and so many times? Or what about the athlete? who trains and trains and puts every ounce of his energy into the sport that he's chosen. And then on that day that he has to perform, if he doesn't perform and run the race according to the set of rules that is laid out, will he ex be expected to receive the prize at the finishing line? We well, see, my dear brothers and sisters, we are all going to finish this life. We are all going to finish the race that we started. There are many who have been waylaid in the race, who sit aside and say, that I, I can't handle it anymore. And for many excuses, they put themselves out of the brotherhood for any reason. But they will eventually, like us, finish the race. And for us, my dear brothers and sisters, in running the eternal race of eternal life, we have been given a very, very clear and a straight path to walk in this our time of probation. We all entered that race to eternal life in the day of our baptism. Our names were recorded in the book of life. And when the judgment seat appears there, if our name's not found in the book of life, why will that be? It won't be because God has been unfaithful. It won't be that the Lord Jesus Christ hasn't been able to save us. It would be because we personally have walked away. The question we have to ask ourselves before taking these emblems is what will be read out of that book of life in the day of judgment? Lionel Deadman? Hypocrite? Whatever? You see, nothing, my dear brethren and sisters, will be hid before all the holy angels, before our Lord Jesus Christ, and before each other when we gather at that judgment seat. We will not be able to pretend then that I didn't mean it. We will not be able to pretend I didn't intend to upset that brother or sister. It will be exactly as we think and exactly our intentions recorded for us to read. And not only for us, but for all of our brethren and sisters. Do we think about that, my dear brethren and sisters? as we run our race. Verse 6 says, The husbandman will be labourers. The husbandman that laboured must be first partaker of the fruits. Do we understand about what this is about? The husbandman that laboured must be first partaker of the fruit. Another translation says this, that he should be first to receive a share of the harvest. Surely the harvest our Lord Jesus Christ will be looking for are all those who stand at the judgment seat. Those who will be given eternal life. And how hard then are we working to receive a portion? And what will our portion be? God willing to receive eternal life. What more could we ask for? What more can God give us but to give us eternal life? Well, how hard are we labouring now to find the salvation? Are we putting more time into our salvation than our daily jobs? Keeping our houses clean? All the things that we want to buy, all the things that we want to do, that will all soon perish. And if our Lord was to come in three weeks' time, what difference would they really make? 
It's all in perspective, is it not, my dear brethren and sisters? And verse 11 says, and of Second, uh, Second Timothy, for it is faithful saying, for if we shall be dead with him, we shall also live in him, with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. Aren't we all dead in Christ? Have we left behind the things of the flesh? Didn't we profess to do this in the day of our baptism? Didn't we swear that we wanted to be a bondservant to our Lord? To do his bidding and not our own? You see, if we are doing the things of the truth, walking in the correct manner, doing those things which are sometimes against our nature, and suffer for the truth's sake, whatever minor things we suffer, won't it be worth it in that day to receive eternal life? None of us would ever say that we would deny our Lord. You wouldn't publicly stand up and say, oh, forget Christ, forget God, forget everything else. And yet in our own private daily lives, in our service to him this week, have we served him? Have we thought about him? Have we read about him? Have we read his message? Or have we been so busy and tired with the things of this world that we have given way to the things of the, our own service and not the things of our God? Verse 13 said, If we believe not, yet he is by his faith, or he cannot deny himself. You say, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful to, to us. He cannot disown himself. Our Lord has died, and our God raised him from the grave, so that we, that you and I, should not perish, but that we might have life eternal. Christ does not want a single one of us to miss out on being part of the age to come. He hasn't called us in vain. He's called us to be part of the wonderful multitude bride of Christ. And he says to us in Luke 12, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples says, Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. But we have to want that kingdom, my dear brothers and sisters. Our God wants us to serve him joyfully. The Lord's not looking for our service and grumpy servants. He wants us to be joyful, encouraging each other, to have the attitude that we are going to be in the kingdom together. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And why would we be ashamed of the things of God? The only time I think you've, I've been ashamed of the Bible is that when debating and talking with another person who believed something different and didn't fully have the answers that I needed and wanted on a particular subject. You know, we can't give an answer for our faith if we don't know what our faith is all about. How can we answer for something that we're not sure about? Let us then never be ashamed. Let us not be lacking in our readings and speaking about the Bible to each other, that we may encourage one another to hold on to the wonderful hope and to build ourselves upon it. You see, if you don't know what you're looking for, how can you be joyful about it? God has set us a very plain path. He's encouraging us to hold fast, to start with each other and to continue for, till that day he arrives speaking about the wonderful saving gospel message that has been given to us. He tells us not to waste our time about vain things of this age that will pass at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Our probation is now, my dear brothers and sisters. It's not to be put off in the future. What we do now will be written in the book of life and how we love our God is now. We can't put off our salvation until next week when we've got time because you know what? Next time we'll be busier than this week. The more we put things off about the word of God, the less likely we are to do it. The teachings of humanism, the rights and the wrongs of mortality and, and what's moral anymore has completely been turned upside down. We know that the book of Revelation 16 tells us about the three unclean spirits that have gone throughout the whole of this world since the French Revolution. For what purpose? To bring this age and the thinking of this world to the great day of God Almighty and they will be thrashed and judged and abolished. And sadly, some of us may have walked away from the truth and will suffer the same thing. We will always find fault with one another. We will always find fault with other people because the quicker we can pass fault on to others, we have less time to examine ourselves and that is completely the thinking of the world. Our God wants us to examine ourselves. And he says here in verse 19 of 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Timothy, sorry, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. The foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Is this what we're doing? But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. The whole brotherhood and the household of God is holy. It is men that put values on gold, silver, wood and earth. Paul tells us to purge ourselves from the, the things and vanity of the men's thinking and to set in our mind a determination to serve our God, to depart from iniquity, that we might be found a vessel, a vessel fit for the master's use. We all have different talents, my dear brethren and sisters. You all have a special talent that I haven't got. Every single one of us has a different way of looking at things. But we all have the same Bible, we all have the same message, and we have to use whatever talent God has given us. It's no point wishing that I was this. There's absolutely waste of time thinking I should be like that. It won't happen, my dear brothers and sisters. We are individuals who are called to be part of the body. We can't all be toenails. We all aren't noses. We are individuals who have got a particular use in the ecclesia. And if we don't use that use in the ecclesia, what are we doing with it? And who's going to suffer? The brothers and sisters in your meeting. We live in an age that is controlled and demanding great time of the computers. With its Facebooks, its forums and all the different things that it's got on it. Where anybody and everybody has a different understanding of what is right and wrong. They comment concerning things, creation, Bibles, right up to making bombs and how to kill people. Is this the world we want to have our mind in? Where everyone is equal, where everyone has his own right of saying and their own opinion is as good as the next one. Well, Paul tells us in verse 23, foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. You know, there's some ecclesias and some things in the Bible that we also argue about, Paul says, put them aside. You have a basis of which to work to. Do it. There's no spiritual uplift at all to be found in all these time wasters. The games, the things, the forums, all 
all vanity and vexation that are plug being pulled will disappear from people's lives completely our service should be that we are servants servants of the living God servants of the Lord Jesus Christ wanting to preach the glad tidings of joy and peace and how should we then approach this in our own arrogance with pride that we are the best that we know the scriptures that we know the Bible because we, as brethren and sisters, know the truth. Is that how we approach our preaching? Well, no, Paul tells us how we should be approaching our preaching. For he says in verse 24, that the servant, and truly this is what we should be, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, I so many times have to look at that and think, yeah, that's really not me. But this is what we're called to be, my dear brethren and sisters, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And you get a Pentecostals in your face and saying, you're hopeless, you don't even understand what the Holy Spirit's gift is all about and what it's for. Then you have to realise that you have to in patience speak the truth. You know, the doctrines of many churches are so way off because they don't know the outcome. By God's good grace, we do know the outcome. We do know what the Spirit is all about. Well, uh, don't oppose them. If God peradventure will give them... Now, you note this, my dear brothers and sisters. It's not you. It's not me. It's God who will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. And how often when we're trying to preach to the poor old people that knock on our door, we ram down their throat that they don't know the Bible. And we are not apt, and we're not kindly, and we don't acknowledge that it's God's the one that is to give the truth. And verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And so many people that are very, very sincere are caught in a snap situation where they don't understand the gospel. The only way that we will ever win people to Christ is by a soft answer. We know Proverbs 15, a soft answer turneth away wrath. And based upon the firm understanding what God has given to us to understand the true gospel message, and again, I say, it's not us that will call that person. We will never, ever convert a person to the truth by our words. Our actions may show to them that there is a way that's different, but it is God that calls. We have to always be ready then at any time, every single one of us, to give an account of that hope that lies within us. As Second Peter tells us to be ready always. For you never know when the time arises where you have to give it. We do all live in an evil age. One that is pressing greatly on the brotherhood. We see that good is counted by this world as evil. And evil is now called as good. The standards of civilization are changing. That which is once frowned upon is now publicly pushed into your face, whether you like it or not. And my dear brothers and sisters, one thing is for sure, it will not get better. It will only get worse until that great day when the Lord Jesus Christ himself returns to this earth and takes us out of the world and takes us to the day of judgment. Well, what does Paul Timothy then continue in chapter 3 by saying, verse 13, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things that thou hast learnt, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them, that as a, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. How and why? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
And may it be, my dear brothers and sisters, as we consider now the emblems before us and consider all the work that our God and the Lord Jesus Christ has done before us, can we consider that we, as we now then partake the emblems, can honestly discern and examine our own lives and see that if our Christ should return today, that we are ready, that we are a man of God and that we have perfected our faith <coughs> And we are thoroughly furnished in our own private works to do that which is right and well pleasing for our master. This morning we have been reminded of our busy lives. We've been reminded of how close our Lord is to returning. And sometimes we grow weary. Sometimes we let the world take over our lives and we don't make time for our Creator. But right here and right now in this hall we have time to clear our minds of everything else and to remember the life of our Lord and our Saviour. The author and the finisher of our faith who invites us to run the race of endurance. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon, which is only achievable by striving together side by side with our fellow brethren and sisters helping each other along the way. This morning to prepare our minds for the bread and the wine, I want to read of the last moments of our, life's, of our Lord's life. Sometimes we don't take the time to consider this final act of sacrifice of our Lord when we come and remember him. The moments he despised the shame. He was looking to the crown that was set before him and he willingly obeyed his father to the point of laying down his life for mankind. Mark 15 records it as, as this and I'll read parts of Mark 15. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council and they bound Jesus and they led him away and they delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things and Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer to make? See how many things are charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further answer. So Pilate was amazed. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion and they clothed him in purple cloak and they twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and they were spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his purple cloak and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw in that way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Let us now th say thanks for the wine. Now for the bread, sorry. Oh, Father, we have just considered the last moments of your son's life. But we know that the cross was just an end of a life given completely to you in perfect obedience. 
33 and a half years of self-sacrifice, denying himself daily to obey you. Sometimes we struggle, Father, to last 33 minutes before we fail when we put ourselves first. Help us, Father, to look to the example of your son's life as we take this bread. To, in, to be encouraged in the fact that he did what we cannot. And, he offered, and you have offered to us the gift of eternal life. Be with us this morning as we remember your son and that gift. So that we may, may be uplifted and motivated to be more like you and your son. Help us to be more like your son. And act selflessly in our own lives to give ourselves to our brothers and sisters. We ask this prayer now by the power of the one whom we remember, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now give thanks for the wine. <coughs> Loving Father, we come before you now as we share this cup of wine, which represents the blood of your Son willingly given on the cross, the final act of obedience, an act of love which we can barely fathom. And Father, in our lives we can be guilty of actions which cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Give us the wisdom to acknowledge our faults and the strength, Father, to turn to your forgiveness and grace when we fail. 
so that we may live our lives according to your ways. We know that our nature will do everything it can to try and stop us from following you. But your word is a light to our feet. And your words of love, which we have remembered this morning, may they help us to overcome the world around us so that we may meet our Redeemer soon and rejoice in that long forward day. Father, we ask his prayer now in his name. Our future King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. After our Lord's last supper before he was crucified, they went out into the mount and they sung a hymn. Let us follow their example with hymn 244.
Further to our announcements this morning, we do note that Brother Lionel and Sister Rose Debman are to leave for Canada tomorrow morning. I would ask them to take their loving fraternal greetings of your brethren and sisters here at Golden Grove. The following announcements will be put into effect if it is the will of our Heavenly Father. Nominations are now being called for elected positions. Uh, and please contact Brother Colin Warner or myself to, um, if you have any nominations for the positions of recorder, finance brother, presiding, exhorting, reading, lecturing, arranging brother, and Sunday school superintendent. Previous uh, service will stand in lieu of nomination unless you let Colin or myself know. The public lecture this evening is to be by Brother John King, and that is to take place at 6 p.m. The subject is What Lies Ahead for Israel. The chairman on that occasion is Brother Tim McGeorge, and on supper tonight and on Wednesday are sisters Lynn Derricky and, and Beck O'Connor. On Wednesday evening at 7.30 p.m. our study class is to take place, and Brother Steve Mance will, will lead us to the topic From the Lights into the Night. The chairman on that occasion is Brother Matt Mackay, the reader Brother Simeon Wigsell, and pianist Sister Belinda Dyer. Next Sunday morning, the uh, Sunday school is to commence at 9am, and the memorial meeting at 10.30am, where the exhort will be Brother John Armonis. The chairman on that occasion is Brother Jake Wright, the pianist for the meeting and for the lecture, Sister Belinda Dyer. Reader and Steward 1, Brother Mike Heinemann. Steward 2, Brother Tim McGeorge. Dorman and Steward 3, Brother Matt Jeffress. And the other Dorman, Brother Phil Lund. On hall cleaning and emblems for this coming week are Brother and Sister Carolyn Heinemann and Brother Dave and Sister Hayley Fotheringham. The public address next Sunday evening will um, be by Brother Sam Mansfield at 6 p.m. The subject is Signs of the Times and the chairman is Brother Jake Wright. Supper on that occasion is to be by Sisters Jess Warner and Andrea Wigsell. The collections will now be taken. The black bag is for the Ecclesial Fund and the red bag this morning is for our Ecclesial Camp.
We've been reminded this morning that we've been called to be servants of our Lord. And we have remembered a man who fulfilled the servanthood to perfection. And as we close our, our meeting in him, our final hymn has these thoughts as well. Heed we the steward's call. There, there is room enough for all. Work, brethren, work. True service of our Lord, his vineyard will afford. He will your work reward. Work, brethren, work. Our closing hymn, 347, to be followed by prayer. Almighty and gracious Father above, we come before your throne of grace now and we thank you for the morning that we have had to be refreshed by your word, to be uplifted by your word and to remember the work of your son. And Father, as we leave here today, we pray that your words will ring in our ears, that we can be your servants and we can be servants to each other so that we can work for each other in your vineyard, so that we can lay down our lives for our fellow brethren and sisters, just as your son has done. And Father, we know that your son is soon to be here on this earth. It is so obvious and evident by the events of the world around us. And we thank you for these signposts, which are constantly there, constantly reminding us that he will be here soon. Help us to use these in our lives as motivation to keep striving towards that long forward day. And Father, we pray that you be with us as we leave here so that we can gather again together in fellowship. So that here, as a family at Golden Grove, we can strengthen each other and grow together. And Father, we leave all our lives in your care. And we ask this prayer in your Son's name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.